Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled Addictive Technology and Its Impact on Teen Brains. Leading today's presentation is Jeremy Edge. Jeremy is the owner and founder of the counseling practice Escaping the Dotcom, PLLC. He is an international gaming disorder certified counselor, and he obtained a digital wellness certificate from the Digital Wellness Institute. After personally experiencing the negative effects of problematic gaming, Jeremy devoted his work to helping those find balance with online activities. Jeremy and his team provide counseling services to help clients of all ages experience balanced, healthy screen use. In today's webinar, we will discuss why it is that no matter the consequence, many of our teens, especially those with ADHD, just can't seem to pull away from their devices. Our expert today will address the impact of addictive technology, including video games and social media, and offer healthy solutions for balance. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking two poll questions for our live audience. First of all, how much time per day does your child spend playing video games? Um, please select the most appropriate answer and note that you can say you're not sure. Um, and then secondly, we'd like to get a sense of the biggest challenges that you face related to your child's video game play specifically. Is it um, policing how much time they're playing, getting them to stop, <laughs> dealing with emotional fallout after video game play? Um, please select the most appropriate answer there. And if you don't see one that reflects your experience, please just use the comment box to tell us about the challenges that your family is dealing with. While you're doing that, I will point out that you can download the slides by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions uh, via email later today. Also, a transcript of today's event will be made available in the coming week. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 451 to access the slides, the replay, certificate of attendance, and transcript. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe. You can sign up now and you will receive our upcoming summer issue, which contains advice for reducing stress in teenagers' lives, tackling messy bedrooms, and getting adolescents to open up to their parents. <laughs> Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Landmark College, the first college in the U.S. to exclusively serve students who learn differently, also offers short-term programs that help neurodivergent high schoolers make the successful transition to college academically and socially. Click the link on your screen or visit www.landmark.edu slash teen to learn more about residential and online options. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Okay, without any further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Jeremy, um, and leading this really important discussion on technology and how it impacts the ADHD teen brain. Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you all are enjoying your day. And I hope this content can be really uh, helpful and insightful. We can get to some questions at the end. But hopefully this content can give you really good tools on how to navigate healthy and balanced screen use for your teens. In general, our topic today is going to be covering a few different things. One will be understanding what behavior addictions look like. All screen use falls into a behavior you know, category, and so it can be an addiction or it can be healthy. Uh, we'll understand when it becomes an addiction, what that looks like. We'll be understanding how screens uh, are impacted from ADHD, kind of what it looks like with some research out there on how media and how games are impacting those who have ADHD. 
We'll be understanding kind of the gaming world, how it's a problem, how it can be healthy, and how it can also be even a career path for some. Then we'll be talking about uh, problematic social media use and what to do with social media and how to be able to understand what's um, keeping us hooked and then how to be able to respond to, to some of those problems. Then we'll be going over some tools and treatments along the way as well for parents and also for clinicians. So the first thing we can understand is a backdrop of a behavior addiction is kind of this broad category um, that can cover any type of behavior. It can be food, it can be work, it can be sex, it can be gambling, but a behavior addiction falls into, you know, there's a, some symptoms around that and screen use can fit into that category. The first one is they cannot stop. They cannot stop the activity at hand. So maybe it's social media or it's playing a game. They cannot stop that activity, even if they try. They cannot control their behavior as well. So maybe they're getting really upset and really, really irritable or, or angry or frustrated, or they're becoming become really depressed. Their emotions and their behaviors are not able to be controlled. That's another symptom of an addiction to a behavior. Um, cravings can be also a part of it. You know, for a substance, there can be a craving, you know, alcohol or drugs. There can be cravings for the activity at hand. You know, I want to play more. I want to be able to engage more with social media or watch more TV. There can be some strong cravings associated with it. There are some really big emotional, negative emotional responses too. So not only can I, they cannot control their behavior, they cannot control when they play or cannot control uh, their time online, but their behavior is also, again, problematic and their emotions are very much dysregulated when they are not able to engage in the activity. They don't see the personal problems. This is a big area or others are talking to them saying, oh, gosh, this is a big issue for you. There's tension at home. There's tension with friendships. Um, but, they, but the person themselves does not see that. And that is also another sign. Um, now, when we look into the, some research around media use and ADHD, there's some information that's very interesting. This first research article talks about 40 years of research covering media use and video games. So watching TV and video games is kind of the basis of what this article is talking about. And they found a few different key things. The first one is there's a small statistical relationship with media use impacting ADHD. Now, so again, there's a small connection, but not a very big one. They found that boys are more impacted than girls are. They found violent video games can increase aggression and it's associated with attention problems. Now, I wanna pause here for a moment because research shows also that video games can increase aggression, but not necessarily violence. Aggression is, I want to punch you in the face. Violence is actually punching you in the face. So there's a difference there. And so it's really natural for us to think, gosh, well, this video game is, is so violent and it's causing so many of these things that are happening in our society. And currently, the, from the research I've seen, there is not research connecting real, um, an act of violence to video games as, as, the, as the reason. There's a lot of things going on for someone to be violent. Loneliness is a big factor in that. Um, the lack of connection to other people, to feeling um, just not very uh, um, a part of the community, not feeling like they have mastery or not feeling like they are um, doing things in the physical world can be a part of that too. Video games can be a part of it. Violent video games can be a part of someone who is violent, but it's not the only thing that is making them do this uh, or encouraging them to do this. There's, they found some inconsistent findings with fast-paced content and ADHD symptoms, meaning if you have a kid watching, you know, PJ Mask or something that's really fast-paced, they haven't found uh, that there is a connection with increasing ADHD symptoms based on watching fast-paced content. Um, and they found there's no connection between age and ADHD symptoms. All right, so that's one uh, research finding. Another one's talking about gaming in particular and ADHD. Now, this one goes from younger kiddos from like four to 12 years old. And they found a few different things where this one in particular found that there's a connection, uh, correlation between severity of ADHD and excessive gaming. So if someone who has um, a lot of impulse control issues, there's, they have severe ADHD, also um, ex played a lot of video games, um, also was more prone to playing a good bit and had a problem potentially with that as well. They found it again, extreme ADHD symptoms showed lower, uh, I'm sorry, showed higher addiction scores. So um, they're more prone to abuse this type of activity of a video game. They also found a bi-directional relationship, meaning uh, someone who has ADHD is, is more prone to play games and likes playing games more so than someone who doesn't. Um, it makes games appealing 
and those who play games, also their ADHD symptoms are exacerbated. It's, it's worsened. Um, video games are um, a really impulse, it's kind of, there's no real impulse control needed sometimes in these games. Uh, a lot of video games reward fast paced multitasking, um, you know, fast paced thinking, not much for deep thinking, not much for, you know, executive functioning, or kind of controlling our impulses. And so whenever you're engaged in, in an activity that rewards fast paced, quick thinking, and you don't have to, um, you know, control your impulses, um, it, it makes this activity appealing. And then it's hard also to get away from that activity and to try to uh, respond to your ADHD symptoms in another format, another way. Males are also at higher risk uh, for ADHD and um, have higher risk uh, than, than females in this research study too. So this is interesting again, friends, because ADHD can impact gaming in particular and vice versa. If your kid if your teenager has ADHD, they may be more prone to play games and they may be gravitated more towards that. So it's just a good understanding to say they could be at risk for abusing games, but not necessarily. We can put up parameters and boundaries so that way they're not going to abuse it and they can have it be a healthy part of their life. Okay, so now let's go into what a gamer profile looks like. Gamers can fall into three big categories. All gamers can fall into three big categories. And the first one is the escaper. They love to play games to escape, to jump into a world, to love, they love the storylines, they love to be immersed in this massive world. They are pretty impulsive and they usually have low self-esteem. Games can be World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XIV, Skyrim, uh, Hogwarts Legacy came out not too long ago. So these are massive words, pe worlds people can get immersed in, and they love to escape. Their primary drive to play is to escape uh, and to explore in this world. The next gamer type is the achiever. They love to play games to win, to ch achieve, to compete. They are motivated to progress and to get better and better at a game rather than to trying to escape into it. Um, these games are very competitive in nature, and they are rewarded for playing well. They're impulsive, but they have high self-esteem. Um, it's similar to someone being good at a sport or, or singing or something like that. They can feel confident in their abilities and in their skills. When someone is playing at a really high caliber of a, of a competitive game and they do well, they feel really good about themselves. They feel very confident. And so their self-esteem is usually higher than those who play solely to escape and to explore. Now, these games can be League of Legends, Fortnite, Overwatch 2, um, Valorant, Call of Duty. These games are all um, competitive, fast-paced, ranked-based games. Um, the next gamer type is the hardcore gamer. Now, this is a mix of the two. They love to escape. They also love to achieve. They identify uh, as a gamer, and they are they love the immersive aspect of it. They love the competition as well. They identify as someone who loves to play games and want to have that be a more part of who they are. Now, they are the most at risk for problematic or disordered gaming. Now, that doesn't mean, friends, that they are disordered. It just means that they're more at risk. Similar to someone who has ADHD versus someone who doesn't, it means they're more prone potentially to uh, overuse this activity and for it to become a problem. So now with that uh, as an understanding, um, most people play in a healthy recreational way. I've seen statistics of 80 to 90% play at a healthy recreational way where video games are not causing them any problems. It's a really fun, good hobby. I've seen uh, this, these numbers show that 10% play and they're at risk, meaning there's some issues going on with their gameplay, meaning they're staying up late every now and then, maybe they're turning in homework late every now and then. Um, there's some at risk from what gaming is causing them. Uh, around 5% play and there are problematic uh, activities around this, this game. So maybe they are um, you know, turning in homework pretty consistently. Maybe they're staying up late every other day. Maybe they're fighting with parents on, on a daily basis. Um, now, 1% to 5% or so, 1% to 4% are, is, can qualify as a gaming disorder. So again, of the 2.5 billion gamers in the whole world, these are the numbers of where people rank as far as if it's legitimate disorder or if it's a problem or at risk. 
Gaming disorder has been identified in the ICD-11 uh, last year in 2022, January 2022, as a full diagnosis. It's in the World Health Organization's identified this, and there's a few different things that make up the criteria. One, there's impaired control, meaning they can't control their gaming, they cannot stop their gameplay. They would rather game than do other activities. So if you see your teenager uh, stop playing soccer, they've stopped doing other things that they enjoy, and they're just focusing on this, then that is another sign. If they continue to game in spite of seeing their problems, then that's another clear sign. Now, this has to impact every area in this person's life, their mental health, their physical health, their relationships, their, their either occupation or their education. And it has to happen for a year's time. If your kiddo uh, really struggles sometimes and meets these criteria, like for spring break, right? Let's say, gosh, you know, they are doing all these things for spring break or even on the weekends. They're doing all these things, but the, but when the school year starts again, if Monday starts and they're able to put away the games and focus and engage in class, then it's not a disorder. It's a problem, like binge gaming is an issue, sure, but it's not an objective disorder. And so I want us to see that this needs to be consistent for like a long period of time, a year's time for it to be an objective disorder. It doesn't mean there's not negatives, right? So a gaming disorder or problematic gaming has a lot of negatives. And for one, there's a lot of anxiety and depression that can happen from it. Gaming usually in today's day and age, 2023, is a physically isolating activity. You can be online talking with your friends, but you're physically usually in your room or in, a, in your house, uh, and you're not physically with other people. You can talk with others, uh, but it can create some anxiety. It can create some depression of, of this isolation, this physical isolation. Um, you can, the more that you play this, you, the more you can feel anxious and depressed. There's a lot of cognitive distortions that can happen, particularly with teenagers. It's like, well, hey, I'm not uh, that I'm not in that much trouble with my parents. I can probably sneak into their room and grab the computer and then come back and play. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Or, hey, I don't have to work on this assignment right now. It's due next week. I'll figure it out later. Or, you know what? Um, this, I, this isn't going to cause too many problems if I play this instead of go out and do something else. There's a lot of slippery slope and, and kind of distortions that can happen uh, when someone is in a problematic or disordered place with games. There's a lot of impulse control issues that can happen. Um, games can be accessed immediately. Online content can be accessed immediately. Going to Twitch or watching the gaming content is a very quick um, response. It's a lot of positive reinforcement can happen immediately. And it's easy and very natural for kids and teens to move away from uh, reinforcements that take a long time, like getting a grade back or studying for something, and they can be impulsive and moving towards a video game. And the more that they do that, the more that they choose or, or act on their impulse to play a game, the harder it is to control that. Uh, another thing is relationship problems can happen. You can see this with parents, I'm sure. You can see this with, all, with friendships and teachers, but uh, relationships can really be strained um, in this dynamic, not just with teens, but for a young adult and for adults, you know, partners, romantic partners can really have a lot of conflict around gaming. I see clients, I'm a licensed counselor, and I see clients in my office struggling with their relationship around gaming a lot of times as well. Finances can be a big piece as well. Financial strain can be a big part of gaming. And if you look at a lot of games these days, they're free to play, but some of them have what's called a loot box. Now, I can't see everyone's hand or I can't see anybody, but uh, you know, if you've seen this, maybe this is, this is familiar to you, but a loot box is something that you can get within a game. This is an example of a game called Counter-Strike Go. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but you can see different colors within the game, uh, within this loot box. You can see a blue, some blue items right here, some purple ones, and then some more rare items right here. And basically these are skins. It's an outfit for something within the game. This is a game where you have a weapon and you're walking around trying to complete objectives. And the weapon can have a dragon on it. It can have like a little purple thing on it. It can have a water piece on it. Um, this is something that makes the game more fun. It's a cosmetic impact. It's basically, if I was in a video game, this is my skin. This is what I'm wearing that helps you know, represent me in the game. Um, 
and, and skins can be very valuable. And uh, in these games, there's about a um, there's some real money in it, and it's also fun for gamers to try to get these skins because there's some rare uh, rarity to it. This yellow item at the very end is about a 0.4 percent chance for someone to acquire one of these items. You can acquire an item by getting a key. Now you can play the game enough to get a to get a key, or you can open it up. Uh, you can buy it with real money, and when you open it up, it looks like this. You can see all the items scroll across the screen and hope to get a rare item. It'll refresh here in a minute. You can see it from the very beginning, but you open it up and you can see what are some items you can get. Again, the more rare, the more valuable the item is. And oh, cool. Now they can play with this skin in the game. It doesn't make them any better. It doesn't make them more accurate in their aim. It's just a fun cosmetic thing about the game. Well, this is all well and fine, but this this mechanic is a gambling mechanic, friends. This is a slot machine uh, in a game. And so a lot of finances, a lot of money can be sunk into opening loot boxes, not playing the game, but just opening loot boxes. And so this is a piece where it's really good to explore and learn about your team's gaming and understand what do they really like about it? Do they love the competitive aspect of trying to compete and strategize and win and get better like in CSGO? Or do they like opening loot boxes in CSGO? Same game, but different reasons, different motivations and different things they like about it. Currently, there's no law against a miner opening a loot box. Um, there is some legislation out there trying to be passed to help put up some limits on loot box, but currently there is not. Now, this is different than like a Fortnite battle pass where you buy content and you know all of what you're going to get. There's no randomness in it. This has variable reward and this has randomness to it. And so that's the element that people can get hooked on potentially and maybe try to gamble in other ways. Um, uh, so that's a little bit of what I kind of want to explore. Like this can be a problem, uh, and we need to explore some of these with our teens. Now, games can obviously be an issue. Games can be a problem. You might even see this with your teens, um, but games can also be a very healthy outlet. Um, it's a great place to socialize, especially during the pandemic. It's a great way to be able to connect and interact with people um, online. It's a great way to create and to build new things. Minecraft, Roblox, for example, are great places to create and to build complex things that are out of reach maybe in the physical world. It's a lot of good competition. It can be good to strive and to compete and try to get better, um, and online games are a good way to do that. Problem solving a strategy is within a lot of games as well, and to, to work that muscle in our brain, it's a really good thing to kind of problem solve and to strategize. Every goal, every game has a goal to work towards. And so that's a good thing. It's good to know, okay, I'm going to fail and I'm, I can, it's okay. I can try it again and again and again. Um, so it's okay to, to learn that failure piece and to work towards a goal. Uh, it's good also to play, right? Games can be a great place to play and to have fun. And kids and teens need to have a healthy place to play. They learn through play. They, they, they are able to really develop through play. And so we need to really encourage that, encourage healthy play. Another aspect of games is from uh, it being a career. Streaming is a way that people can make a living from uh, playing a game. And so video game um, video games can be played live in front of people. There's this person named, uh, streamer named Ninja, or Richard Blevins. He plays Fortnite, and he's been making a living from playing Fortnite and other games. He'll play a game while other people watch him. They like his content. They think he's really good. He's funny. He's attractive. He does some crazy things online. So it's a, it's a lot of good content that people are attracted to, and streaming is a way to do that. Richards is interesting. He's currently 31 years old. In 2019, he's made $17 million. Just, just uh, 2019. That was pre-pandemic numbers. Um, and so he's made a lot of money from streaming. He's been asked to play certain games for $50,000 an hour so that those game companies can get their content out there and a lot of people will watch him. Uh, Ninja is interesting because there was an interview I'd encourage you to check out, um, and it's a pretty long interview, but between uh, two minutes and 13 seconds and three minutes and 23 seconds, they ask him, well, what do you tell parents? What do you tell all the 16 to 17 year olds who want to make a living gaming, who want to stop everything and to play games? What do you tell them? And basically he says, 
whenever he was pursuing this, he maintained his job at Noodles and Company. He went to college. He maintained his grades in college. And he worked to, to compete competitively in Halo. And he worked on streaming. He worked on being able to improve his streaming numbers um, and to make that a reality. He didn't just drop everything and go to this. He encouraged kids. Look, you can't, he says, you can't just stop everything and try to make this happen. It's a very competitive market out there. And we need, you need to be smart about how you engage with this activity. If you're able to make it, fantastic. But you also need a plan for your future um, to make that happen as well. And so it's a really encouraging interview. I'd encourage you to check out. If your kids know who Ninja is or they respect him, they like him, you know, have them check it out too. Um, because it's really encouraging to say, look, this guy's made it. He's made a living from streaming, but he's, he's not encouraging to drop everything. I work with clients who want to drop everything. Either they're in high school or they're out of their parents' nest in their young adult years, but struggling to make it into the into that next stage in life, struggling with that transition because they see an opportunity to be a streamer. They see they want to be a pro gamer and that's what they are focusing on. Meantime, they are neglecting their physical health, their mental health. Uh, they're not able to make any living. They're not have, they don't have a job. They can't keep a job. And so it's a really big struggle. And again, I share this information to say, your kids may say, I want to be a pro streamer, rather than saying, holy crap, my life is doomed. Uh, it's natural to think that. I would encourage us to think, you know what? This could be a reality, but let's be smart about it, okay? Not everyone can be Taylor Swift. Not everyone can be Michael Jordan. Some can, but not all. And so I would encourage you to be able to say, look, this could be a reality, but let's also be smart about how we pursue this. Another way people make a living from games is through esports. And esports is the pro world of gaming. For football, we have the NFL. For basketball, we have the NBA. And so esports is that pro organization for games. Currently, there's around 57 total games that have uh, organizations that you can compete and play in. In the U.S., there's around 19,000 players, and they've made over $169 million uh, in their earnings. This is just in the U.S. There's a lot of pro teams and a lot of in, uh, interest internationally. And so this is something that is a big interest for a lot of people um, around the world. Uh, there's a game in particular that's really um, exciting. It's a game that is called Dota 2. It's a five versus five competitive game. And they have a world championship every year. And their world championship in 2021, their prize pool was $40 million. This was one game of the 57. So not every game is this big. Not every game has this uh, prize pool, but some do. And so there's a lot of teenagers and young adults out there saying, well, I want to make it big. I want to go pro and be on a pro team. And I want a shot of this money. I want a shot of being at a pro uh, on a pro level. And so when new games come out, they can really be saying, look, this is my time to shine. This is when I need to go and I need to do this. Um, Esports is also interesting because in the U.S. in particular, actually in Arlington, which is not too far away from where I am in Dallas, they have an esports stadium. It's a 100,000 uh, square foot building, holds 2,500 spectators, just devoted to esports. So it's an interesting field that is emerging. Now, uh, games can be a career. It's something that we should be aware of as parents and as educators. Now, for those parents out there wondering, okay, so what do I do with my gamer? There's a lot of issues or challenges. I'm not sure what the heck to do. The first thing I'd encourage you to do as a parent is to be the role model and mentor for healthy screen use. If you don't play games, that's fine. But you do interact with screens probably in some way. And so let's engage with that in a healthy, intentional way and bring your teen and bring your kid along with that. Why are you answering your emails at a certain time? Or, you know, what makes this show more interesting to you? Or what are you doing online on social media? And why is that important? You don't have to share every detail. But if you can give them a lens into your reason and your intentionality with your devices, that can be a great way, a great model for your teens to do a similar thing. Um, it's also good to understand our teens' perspective. This is a great clip. It says, oh, look at little Henry making worlds with his imagination and old wooden building blocks. And it says, Minecraft, witchcraft is what it is. Repent, sinner. Uh, and this is a really great clip because a lot of times as parents, we can see something in the physical world, like building with wooden blocks is a good, innocent, awesome thing. I can't, you know, gosh, I can't, we can't get enough of this. This is awesome. But the minute that our kids can go online, it's like, well, all hell broke loose. Like, what's going on? I don't understand what this is. And I'm, I'm fearful. I'm angry. And it's not good. 
And really, Minecraft can be a lot of things, but Minecraft also can be a similar way to just build with wooden blocks. It's a digital way to build something, to build anything. So it can be a good thing. It can be a very good, healthy outlet and activity. And we need to learn what their perspective is on what they're doing and engaging with online. A way to do that is to have non-judgmental conversations explore and, and have some open uh, ended questions to ask your, your teenager talk about like what do you like about your games you know what is this and show me this and help me understand kind of what you're doing just to learn uh and it be non-judgmental in what we're what they're doing online with that as a base we can then go into setting clear boundaries and consequences if we start off with this iron fist of this is bad this is horrible you're a bad person because of this it's going to push them away and we're going to they're not going to listen to us and they're going to it's going to drive a further and further wedge and games are going to be this wedge is going to be getting in the way of that relationship. But if we can say, all right, I understand where you're coming from. I like how you're building here. This is awesome. This is fun. Um, this is really cool. I don't like how you're cussing them out every two minutes, right? I, I don't like how angry you get whenever you play online. I don't like how you're talking to random people and giving them your detailed information of where you live. I don't like that. That's not healthy and that's not good. And here's why. And so it's good to have these clear conversations of what's appropriate, what you like about it, but then integrate, you know what, let's change it up a little bit. And here's why it's going to help you to do that. It's also good to empower our teams in particular to say, you know what, I see that this is a great tool for you and how can you utilize it to help enhance your life and add more value to your life rather than us saying we have to, you know, as a parent, we have to take away all their privileges. We have to limit their time online. Let's empower our teams to say, well, what do you need to be healthy and safe with your games, with social media, with being online? Um, it's also good to try to engage in other activities. And a lot of times parents, and you've asked these questions before, it's like, well, they don't want to do anything else, right? Teens are like, well, if I'm not playing games, there's literally nothing else to do. I've, I've checked. There's, there's nothing to do in the entire world. Um, so a way to do that, a way to navigate what else to do is to look at their transferable motivations. What that means is let's take a game like Minecraft. And maybe their motivation to play is to build, to create uh, to create something new and to, and to solve complex problems, to create systems to make something work better, more efficiently. We'll take those elements which are good and positive and maybe move that towards something like robotics, something that's going to also enhance their creativity and their problem-solving skills. Let's take a game like Valorant. It's a very fast-paced game based on progression, based on getting better, based on competition, and based on challenging yourself to get better. A similar way to enhance those motivations and to move that towards something else could be something like rock climbing. Rock climbing, similar to Valorant, you can get better and better and start off not very good, but get better and better at it. You can compete in tournaments. You can compete in Valorant tournaments. You can also compete in rock climbing tournaments and get paid for it. So there are some similarities that we can move some of these things into other activities but it's how we engage with it. The more that we learn about our gamer, the more that we learn about our teenager and learn what they like about their games and not to demonize everything, take the positives, let's move that towards something else that can add maybe more value to their lives. A lot of times parents ask me, well, how much time? Just tell me how much time I need and I'll get out of your hair, appreciate it, thanks, goodbye. Um, it's hard to answer that, guys. It's really hard to answer that, friends, because every teen is different. If you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they say, um, you know, high quality programming for six and under, about one hour. For teens, it's vague. It's broad. It says have a healthy, well-balanced life. Okay? So to find that is to fill out something like this or to make something like this. This is an example of a 24-hour day of your teen's day. Maybe it's spent hopefully eight hours or so of sleep. School's in there too. And then the rest of the afternoon can be filled of maybe reading, extracurricular activities. Uh, not sure how much homework they got, but you know, a couple hours of homework or so maybe. Uh, some meal time, free time, even it's good to have built-in time to do you know, unstructured play. And then at the top here, we can see it says screen time. It could be gaming time, could be social media time, could be YouTube. It could be entertaining screen time, entertainment focused screen time right? Because a part of that homework can be all online, right? If they're writing a paper and doing research or math, it can all be online. 
But the screen time up here is the entertaining type of screen time. So again, watching TV or playing a video game. This is a good way to get like a, a screen, do a screen time inventory to be able to kind of process, okay, so how much time is in this kiddo's day and where can they, you know, what, what can we do as far as having some time online? In general, I would say an hour or two hours is a good baseline for time on video games per day. Um, depends on your kiddo. Okay, another way to look at it is through this parenting triangle. I've worked with Jody Bechtold in another course, and we made a course, and this is a really good idea on how we navigate parenting, usually as parents with kids who play games. Most of us have to set up really strong limits. A lot of our interactions with our teens are focused on limit setting, boundaries on when they can and cannot play. Some interactions are ignored. Right, We can't address every single thing our kiddos do. And some of it, we have positive interactions or rewards. I like how you were kind to your sister. I like how you came home and did your homework first. I like how you came to dinner whenever we asked the first time. Some of it is rewards, but the most of our interactions are focused on limit setting. I think we need to flip it. I think we need to be able to say, yes, limits are important and we need to focus on limits and con setting consistent boundaries and consequences. We need to have some intentional ignoring, but I think a lot of us need to have time with engaging with positive interactions, positive rewards, um, meaning like, I like how you're doing this and kind of focus on positive interactions. We don't have to reward them with money or give them anything, but we just can give them positive attention. And we can focus on that. That can help improve the relationship. They can help know that we're on their side and they can listen to us better uh, as well. And so this is a really good way. I would encourage you to check out how to, you know, re um, refocus our parenting a little bit. All right. So gaming time is a big issue. Screen use and social media can also be a big issue too. The hook model is how a lot of social media companies keep us coming back for more. You can see it starts with a trigger, um, a notification, right? Then we go into our phone. We see, we open up the app, see what's on Instagram, and we get some type of reward. We don't always get a lot of likes or posts or comments, but sometimes we get a lot. And that's a variable reward mechanic that's very addicting. Variable reward is a part of gambling. It's it's in you know any type of slot machine or any type of gambling is a variable reward, which keeps us coming back for more and more. Then we invest more time back into the app uh, to post and, and like, and then we, the cycle continues. To get away from this hook model, there's a few things we can do. One is to understand the awareness of this is happening. And then we can create friction by managing triggers. We can turn off all notifications. We can kind of just... Um, get notifications from real people rather than apps or products. Um, creating friction means giving yourself space from that idea of I wanna check out this app um, with time and space. Meaning, okay, you get a notification or even a thought of I wanna check Instagram, count to 10. You know, count to 20 backwards by twos. Give yourself even physical space. Have the phone physically away from you or your teen. So they have to get up to go do that. Um, to check the phone. It's also good to inverse the variable rewards, meaning give yourself rewards for being away from your device. Pocket points actually gives you rewards for being away from your device by um, rewards for restaurants. Um, Forest is a game, is a, it gamifies being away from your device. You turn it on and put your phone down and a forest grows. And the longer you're away from your device, the more time you're away from your device, the forest grows and grows and grows. If you pick it up early, it dies off, it's not as good. Um, another thing to do is I encourage all of my teens in particular to use Freedom. It's a very good software that helps with distraction online and helps with engaging you in a different way. There's some really good research around social media. And so let's talk about a few different keys uh, points in this. This was from um, 2020. Um, and it was published in 2020. And it goes over 594 publications. And they found this information on social media and mental health. There's a small negative mental health effect from social media use. They found intense social media use can actually increase our social capital and social support. They found appearance focused content can lead to body image disturbance. And they found no direct association between social media use and life satisfaction and loneliness. This is a big one, friends, right? Because the social dilemma and some videos have come out saying like, hey, social media is really bad. And it, at times it totally is. 
Um, but also they didn't find in these publications any direct association between social media use and life satisfaction. They found that age and gender had no effect, no moderating effect on mental health, but culture and personality did, meaning the culture and personality of the person had an impact on how social media impacted their mental health. So this is a these are some big, interesting findings, friends. And I think the takeaway is if we can intentionally use social media, then that's a really great way to engage with the product. Um, in general, here are some tips. We need to avoid comparisons. We need to know what's healthy for us and, and focus on that. And um, talk about image-based platforms and to know with our teams that this is something that is um, things are inappropriate or kind of um, not um, the standard, right? Right. This just know that image-based platform content um, is out there. It's good to have a device-free bedtime. A lot of times we can check our social media feeds but before we go to bed. It can get in the way of sleep. It can also create more FOMO or the fear of missing out, seeing our friends engage in things that we're not a part of. Um, it can it's also good to monitor our mental health is knowing kind of as, as a precursor where we're at. If there's research that also shows that if we are all, if we are depressed, if we're feeling pretty depressed or anxious, and we go on social media, we can feel more depressed. It can exacerbate these feelings, right? So it's good to know, okay, so how am I feeling mental health wise? And then, you know, if I'm feeling depressed, maybe I should talk to a friend or go do something else rather than check out social media. It's going to be an active social media user rather than kind of passively just doom scrolling, really engaging, provides the most positive outcomes for social media. Okay, um, it's good to be aware of our time on social media as well. That is a good way to say, look, I'm spending a lot of time on this. Maybe I can redirect some of my focus, my attention. Um, if we are having a problem, if we are, if we, our kids are in this problematic place, either with games or social media, this is what we can do. SMP5 means stop problematic screen use for 60 days and pivot, okay? At least 60 to 90 days, stop the specific online activity, either a video game, video game content, or social media as an example. Attend a support group. Attend a 12-step support group can be fantastic. ITAA, Internet Technology Addicts Anonymous, is a great way to do that. You can also redirect motivations, meaning, um, like we talked about before, find other activities to move towards. We need to improve our relationships with others. And we also need to address these underlying issues. A lot of times we use games or, or social media to cope with challenges. We need to address those things. We also need to set up protective factors. Protective factors are systems in place to help keep us at a positive place in our life. One way to do that is filling out this document. I've created this with, again, Dr. with uh, Jody Bechtold. This is from my training, but I've adapted it to help my clients in particular find balance for them. Um, it's a great way to say, all right, what is disorder? What's really unhealthy? And what does it look like in an ideal or in the past world, what these areas look like in our, in our activities, in our peer relationships with nutrition, exercise, sleep and hygiene, parental relationships, if it's, a, if it's an adult, romantic relationships, education or occupation, and mental health. I think spirituality can be another piece of this as well, friends. But I think if we're able to I, I figure out, okay, so for this person, what does it look like to be healthy and balanced? We can focus on staying in these areas. And then we focus on what is problematic or at risk look like in that same area. Maybe they are enjoying soccer. Maybe they enjoy chess and an hour of gaming per day. Maybe at risk can look like uh, not much soccer. They're skipping all of their chess practices and they're gaming two to three hours a day. But disordered is like five to seven hours a day of gaming. So it's a little bit different, um, but it's, it's not like the best, right? Right. And so filling this up can really help our teams have a good picture of what can be healthy and balanced for them. Ultimately, all screen use in my perspective, friends, is like food. We could eat cheeseburgers and french fries all day long, uh, but we feel like crap. It would not be good. Um, we could eat healthy foods and it would really have a positive impact on our health and well-being. How we interact with technology can be similar. If we interact with entertaining, entertainment-focused content, watching Netflix, playing video games for fun, uh, on social media for fun, if it's just that, it's not going to be healthy for us. But if we engage in it and being productive online and have it be fun, it can be a healthy balance. Finally, here are some research, uh, here are some tools of treatments I would encourage, some psychotherapy um, modalities, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivation, doing, and acceptance, commitment therapy, 12-step recovery groups. This uh, GAA is Gamers Addicts Anonymous. There are some support groups of group support. Group, um, group therapy can also be very good. 
inpatient facilities do exist. This restart one is in Seattle, Washington, um, and it's devoted strictly for gaming disorder. Um, opioid receptor antagonists can be some medications to help. Here are some resources I would encourage you to check out. Geek Therapeutics has more research and a lot more training on uh, integrating geek culture and therapy. Mm -hmm. HealthyGamer.gg is a psychiatrist who's on Twitch who's really good at promoting balanced gaming. Here's the link for ITAA. Game Quitters has a hobby tool that helps teens and people find other activities they can get involved in. I have a course online that helps parents and teens navigate balanced and healthy gaming. And I also have a summer program where we do seven or we do 10 different activities throughout the week. It's like a day camp here in Dallas where they learn how to do some woodworking, they exercise, they do some equine therapy and more. Um, so friends, that is, uh, these are my references also from our time today. today. Um, we do have some time for some Q&A. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions that we have. I had think we had some before we started. Um, so, uh, Annie, I will give it over to you, I guess, for the yes. questions or how can I move towards this? Yes. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That you covered a lot of ground. It was fantastic. Um, and we have a lot of questions. I'll just quickly thank our sponsor, Landmark College, one more time before digging in here. Um, a lot of people wondering, you mentioned the red flags and criteria around problematic gaming. It, mm -hmm. Are there similar um, criteria um, guidelines for parents who see um, YouTube addiction specifically. This is a, a pretty prevalent theme I'm seeing in the comments. And also um, to know when uh, your child is engaging in problematic social media use. Sure. Good question. So YouTube is very popular these days with teens. Um, and so I think I would look at the same criteria for what a gaming disorder or a behavior addiction looks like and, and fill in YouTube instead of it being gaming. If they are, uh, if they're not able to control their YouTube time, if they want to spend more and more time on YouTube, if there are really big emotional outbursts every time um, YouTube is, you know, trying to get away from YouTube or do other activities, if they're neglecting their other responsibilities, their schoolwork, their friendships, their other responsibilities of, of a sport or something, because specifically because of, of YouTube, their mental health, their physical health and sleep are deteriorating because of YouTube, then I think that is clear that, okay, so this is a pretty big issue and potentially a disorder. Uh, there is no disorder for social media or YouTube or virtual reality or, uh, or shopping online um, in like the DSM, which is, you know, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or the ICD right now. Gaming disorder though is. And so I think we can use that as a baseline to say, if my child or teen is experiencing similar levels of uh, problems, um, but in a different capacity online, let's just kind of translate some of the verbiage and say, okay, so there's no formal diagnosis, but objectively, this kind of matches up. This kind of this kind of meets what I'm seeing, if that makes sense. And social media as well. Um, I can't remember the, the second part of the question, but I think, yeah, social media can, again, be similar capacity of if they're wanting to spend more and more time on it, and that could be an issue. One thing I would encourage, though, friends, is let's look at the motivation behind it. If our teens are going online and spending like, four hours a day on social media, but they're really engaging with friendships and they're enhancing their friendships. They're working on school projects. They're also able to meet new people and to learn new things. Then that could be a healthy way to engage with social media. But if it's simply like an entertainment focus, they're neglecting the other responsibilities and there are problems in their overall health and well-being because of this one activity, then that's when it's becoming an issue. Um, I would encourage us to look internally and say, well, what are some of the biases we have um, maybe against some of these things? That was a long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> no, that was super helpful. Um, and a, a question that was on my mind just came through in the stream here. Um, and that is about if you could just talk about the addictive qualities of, for example, Snapchat streaks. Um, oh, I mean, man. these are yeah. designed, right, to keep our kids lashed to their phones. So, A, could you talk a little bit about that, which is a problem? And B, um, I would love to address ways that parents can engage their kids in conversation about recognizing how social media use specifically is making them feel. You don't see the anger, the outbursts quite as much. It's a little more internal and insidious in ways. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. I I did a presentation for a high school over here for um, like all the high school and his his teenage boys, and they. I talk about, we talked about Snapchat and they said, yeah, like the only reason I'm doing Snapchat is for the streaks. I don't really care about honestly the relationship because the, what's I'm the focused on is maintaining the streaks. And so it's gamifying this relationship. And so I think um, I would encourage like just having open conversations with your teenagers. Like, what do you notice about Snapchat? What do you, what do you notice about these streaks thing? I've heard streaks are, you know, kind of crazy. You can make a joke about it. Right. But, but I think try to make it lighthearted and help them have the space to talk about this can be a good place to navigate. Well, what's, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? What do you notice this is doing for you? You know, I think that I, that word of his notice, you know, what's the impact of what you notice is a great way to kind of help them chew on these ideas rather than saying, well, this is bad because of X, Y, and Z, especially with teenagers. If we say, Hey, do this or don't do that or stay away from that. Usually a lot of times they're going to want to go the other direction. And so I think if we can give them the platform, uh, the space to think about and to process these ideas, they can they can say, oh, you know what? Yeah, that makes sense. I I I think that I'm valuing these streaks more, this 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 long, you know, exchange versus it being a, a real deep relationship. And so I think um, we can try to focus on like how can you have different relationship or different interactions to help improve these relationships. How is how is Snapchat? Snapchat helping you improve these relationships or what's, how is it maybe impacting or negatively impacting your relationships? Um, so I think it's a way to kind of navigate that. So tough. Um, so um, a number of parents are wondering, is it ever appropriate to just go cold Turkey, whether it's video games or social media um, you know, basically they've had it. The kids are sneaking devices, sneaking time. They're seeing the negative consequences, but the kids are not engaging in these conversations. Um, is pulling the plug ever a good idea or would you recommend another step? Um, first? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And honestly, I think, you know, your kiddo best, I would encourage to try to focus on balance. You can set up different parameters and boundaries, um, less time. I think it's okay though, to say, look, we're just going to take a break for two months and then we can talk about integrating it back again. If this has been a kind of a longstanding issue, you've noticed really big disrespect and challenges and a lot of issues with school. It's okay to say, we're just going to take a break from this um, because it seems like objectively your behavior is becoming more problematic. It seems like there's a lot of, um, you know, failing grades or lower grades point to objectively some outcomes of what you're seeing. If we just say, we don't like how much time you're spending online. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to them. Um, their world is online. And so if we're able to point to objectively the, the negative health outcomes of their time online, that's easier to process. It's going to be help, help them to say, okay, well, I, I, I do value, you know, my future. I do value my time with friends. So I can do that, but maybe in different ways. And so I think going cold turkey is fine. I would encourage to move towards other activities that they can find enjoying, you know, they can enjoy and they can, you know, uh, they can like. Um, they won't probably like that immediately, but they can, the more they get into the habit of doing it, the more that they can, they can enjoy that other stuff. I think we need to speak to the behavior that we're seeing in these objective outcomes rather than focusing on, you know, games or or, or, or social media is, is the reason. Um, it probably is honestly the reason, but I think at least to help our teens see that, look, we're, we're focused more on the behavior and on your, your education and mental health uh, as well. So I think cold turkey is fine, um, as well as trying to navigate the balance. <clears throat> I love that, the focus on not just the time online, which obviously does concern so many of us, but it's really... Yeah. Yeah, it's really the behavior. Um, and it kind of dovetails with a, another question we're seeing here from parents of over 18 year olds who mm, no longer yeah. have, you know, parent, formal parental controls. And they're wondering, um, well, I'm wondering for those, um, those of us with kids under 18, you know, how we can kind of build the foundation so that our kids um, are participants that they're that they're learning how to regulate their own time and they're not totally dependent on us to be the police um you know we would like them at 18 <laughs> to not be spending 23 hours a day on devices uh 
That's a great point. That's a great point. Gosh. And I think, you know, a, a way to compare it is like whenever we, our kids go to college, hopefully they will know how to d- d- practice the discipline of getting their homework in on time. Right. They'll be able to they've practiced uh, getting up in the morning, you know, being responsible for their things and, and driving to different places and being able to manage a schedule, you know, appropriately ish. Right. Like not perfect, but but most of the time, hopefully our kids have been trained and guided on how to navigate a college or, or post high school world pretty effectively, not perfectly, but but effectively because they've had practice. I think the similar thing can go with online time. If we can help pr- provide them with some uh, earlier in life, kind of uh, young kiddos and even teenagers, giving them opportunities to have that freedom, but for them to practice regulation, that's where ultimately around like 18, 19 or so when they're out of the nest, then they can feel more empowered, they can feel ready to control some of the stuff. So practically it can look like young kiddos, elementary school, you know, having, putting up those boundaries themselves, maybe in middle school, we have a, give them a little bit more freedom, give them a little bit more time to make choices. And then in high school, we can try to give them some more opportunities to say, okay, um, you know, what do you need to be successful with online time? If you notice that there's, they're not managing it well, then we can engage and reinforce some boundaries. But again, try to give them as much as possible that interaction and try to, you know, give them the the benefit of the doubt. Um, A counseling term we use is positive, unconditional positive regard. And it's hard to as as a parent, but let's try to have that perspective of unconditionally, I see you in a positive light and I see that you can be successful. I see that you'll be, um, you'll be, you'll be a good um, prospering adult and, and to portray that and to empower them in that even in high school to say, look, you can do this. You can manage your screen time. It's hard, but it's possible. You know, we don't tell our kids, hey, you can go into a candy store and just have at it, right? Have unlimited access, have at it. You know, we, as a kid, as kids, we, we uh, you know, have to put that in, in place. But when they are adults uh, or in high school, hopefully they'll go in and pick a few things from the candy store and leave or a candy store, right? Um, and the same thing is with online time. We need to set up really good boundaries online. And then later on, they can be able to intentionally pick out and, and engage online in a healthy way. Great. And for those parents out there who do have young adults who are beyond the realm of parental controls, um, can you offer any strategies for them for how they might be able to help them um, perhaps rein in, uh, recognize and rein in problematic screen use? Yeah, I would encourage try to have like natural consequences happen for these older adults or older kiddos, basically. Um, so if they're in school and they're failing or dropping out, rather than you bailing them out with a loan or having to say, okay, we'll, we'll do something for you, try to put it on them to say, well, what do you need to do, man? Like, what do you need to do to be successful in this or that? Um, you know, if they can't make rent or something to say, look, what can you do to help to make this happen, to make ends meet? you know, talk to them about, you know, look, your actions have these consequences. If they are unable uh, to make healthy choices themselves and talk about, look, what do you think about us helping with giving you boundaries online? Or, you know, there are some parents I noticed that have been able to put up online software blocks and things like that on the devices. It could be worth to say, um, you know, look, let's get some counseling either for the, t- the young adult or even for parents to help navigate how to what that looks like. I think um, in general, we need to be able to empower them. Uh, but also if they are unable to balance, let's say, online gaming time with school, then it's okay to take away that online gaming computer or device to give them more focus and attention when needed. Um, to that activity. So it's a hard thing to balance. But I think if we're intentional, then that we could give them the support in that. Okay, great. Um, and a reality for so many parents here today is that their kids have um, a lot or all of their work is actually due on computers. Um, so they're in Google Classrooms and um, working on computers even during school time, but definitely during homework time, which makes it extra challenging. Um, yep. <laughs> advice for monitoring that required screen time um, and any, you know, you mentioned a few technologies that could be used. Maybe um, if you know of any, um, you know, Chrome plugins or other that um, can help parents with this challenge. 
Um, I would, uh, I kind of go back to uh, the Freedom app. And so Freedom is basically during certain time periods, kids are not able to, anyone is not able to access things that they don't want to. So distractions of YouTube, of Snapchat or whatever, it blocks those things during certain time periods. And so it provides the user with access to just focus on productive schoolwork, let's say, but they don't go to YouTube or they can't access Instagram um, when this is on um, when this is online. So that's a really good one. There's some other parental controls that we haven't talked about bark or net nanny or a couple other ones I would check out. Um, but I think when it comes to the balancing kind of school time with technology versus entertaining time, if we can have separate devices, one devoted just to schoolwork, the other one devoted just for play, and even separate uh, places to do the homework can be also good. Having a room devoted just to do schoolwork, another room just devoted to entertainment or fun can be great to separate the two out um, as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, since we are out of time, maybe, Jeremy, we can pick your brain on a few other apps um, and um, add-ons and things. Um, and add those to the resources for people who who attended today. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, but that was incredibly informative um, and so helpful. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this presentation. Yeah, thank you, Annie, for the time. Absolutely. And we hope those of you who attended um, enjoyed this session and that you'll join us again. We have another free webinar next week. Um, it's on the topic of ADHD grandfamily. So grandparents who are raising um, neurodivergent grandkids. And that's with Dr. Caroline Mendel. So we hope you can join us and we hope you'll sign up to learn about all of our upcoming webinars, research updates, and more at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks again for joining us.